Welcome to this episode of How We Made That App. I'm your host, Madhukar Kumar. I started my career as a developer and eventually went to product management and finally product marketing. In today's episode, we have the CEO and co-founder of Ottomans Institute, a company that builds AI-based teachers. His name is Dev Aditya. Welcome, Dev. Great to have you here. For our audience, do you mind just giving a quick background about who you are as well as Ottomans Institute and what they do? Yeah, absolutely, Madhukar. So first of all, fantastic to be here. Uh, thank you for having me on the show. I'm Dev Aditya. I'm one of the co-founders of Ottomans Institute. Uh, we call ourselves now OIAI. We are a uh, deep tech generative AI, uh, avatar AI company. And we build digital human teachers powered completely by AI that teach humans, mainly for corporates and educational institutions. Yeah, I saw on the website that uh, there are digital AI assistants that looks like teacher, which is fantastic. But I take it that you built this company and this tool long before the chat GPT and OpenAI became very, very popular. So tell us a little bit about uh, the founding part of it. Like, how did you come up with the idea? What did you decide to do? And when did you found this company? Yeah, so it's been quite a journey. So my co-founder and myself, we were in the same university, Brunel University, London. And she was the president. I was the vice president of the union. So after that, we were traveling with some friends and we thought we'll you know, teach in Asia in some countries. And after that, we found a gap at that time. Uh, mainly focusing on transferable skills and employability skills training. So, uh, you know, one of those things are that they start actually removing it as you could get hired into education in that part of the world, uh, which we thought was a problem. And then we created our company when we had our first contract from a state government uh, in India. So we created our company and formed it in February of 2020. Literally two and a half weeks before the lockdown started, I got stuck in India for six months, but that was, uh, you know, that's another story. But the main bit of the story, you know, in terms of where we are now is we registered at that time, we had to completely digitalize our offering. And at that time, we were training one-to-one and one-to-many with our trainers. And we scaled to nine countries in 2020 itself. So uh, we scaled to nine countries. And when we scaled, uh, because we were scaling so fast, probably that's one of the reasons, uh, the main bottleneck that we found was that we could not really scale our teachers and trainers. It was very difficult to hire uh, you know, at, at such a rate. Quality control was an issue. Also, in essence, no two human beings teach in the same way. So we thought, let's try and digitize at least part of that. You know, teachers, teaching is an intelligent job. We cannot use you know, structured sort of systems there. So we said, let's, you know, try with AI. So in January of 21, we had our first version. It was a fully functional version. And it taught some students that it went on to teach refugee learners in UNHCR BCF camps in northern Iraq. So that's when we started. And we also did some sort of research there. And we found a lot of in research level scales that they found the avatar that was teaching at that time, Beatrice, to be human-like, they found her to be socially present, to be warm, etc. So that really told us that there is something there. It is pre-generative AI, so uh, at that time it was a very, very, uh, you know, the best way of putting it was uh, if-then sort of model. We had to write about, you know, in Excel sheets first, uh, question answers, etc. about 30,000 lines. We did that, but we saw that signal. And then from that time, that became our core focus. Uh, we changed our model completely. And now we have digital human teachers using our own fine-tuned language model that's fine-tuned for teaching. We call it OI MISA 7B. It's a 7 billion parameter model. And currently, it's a teacher that teaches for higher education institutions and also does L&D and teaching for big corporates. When you started teaching, what were the topics that you were teaching? And uh, you mentioned that you were also teaching refugees. Uh, Was it over the phone? Were they primarily doing it? over the computer what was the mode so the refugee part was you know the trial part and that's something we actually continue to do today but that's a csr activity but one of the things of you know device based limitations in a lot of places are actually close to a myth it's sort of avoided because actually the paying capacity may not be there 
but most people tend to log in. They have at least within their reach somehow uh, mobile phones, smartphones, etc. So people can tune in. We also work with partners like UNICEF where they couldn't tune in or didn't have the right internet. They were going into computer labs set up by UNICEF for other schooling activities as well. So that's what we did. And for our 35,000 odd learners in 2020, 2021, in that traditional model, it was essentially, we ended up teaching on Zoom itself. And one of the reasons, you know, one of the findings was we had our own LMS, but that had another spike of education that we needed to give. Everybody knew Zoom at that time in lockdowns. So we switched to Zoom. And how did the uh, teaching work in the sense, uh, let's say if I am the student and Beatrice, I love the name and I'd love to know how you named it. But uh, let's say I'm talking to Beatrice. Am I just asking free flow questions or is there a curriculum and it delivers certain content and then I get to engage? How? What's the actual mode? Yep. So uh, Beatrice was our first teacher. So about the name as well. At that time, we were really heavily bootstrapped, right? Because we had just started. So Beatrice is actually one of our friends who volunteered to model, to be the model for the first teacher. That's why it's Beatrice. Currently, one of our main teachers is Kaya, completely created by us, not modeled on anybody. And, you know, we, we, we name accordingly. But how does the system actually work? The system works in this way. First of all, the teacher teaches content, right? The content is also created by the AI. And now what we do is, if you are an institution or a corporate, you have your own IP-related content, right? Or you have your own preferred papers or your own preferred notes. You can literally slip that in into the AI up to 340 pages. Within three minutes, the AI is able to digest and synthesize that. Then she teaches. Now, when she teaches, after every subtopic which she picks up, she will test you. You know, multiple choice questions, quizzes, etc. She's going to test you and go to the next section when she is satisfied. We also have something called the raise hand button, just as you do on Zoom, etc. So you raise the hand, she stops. Uh, you can ask questions, ask her to re-explain. You can do a deep dive, that sort of stuff. Wow. So it, it almost feels like that I could customize the entire education one-on-one. -on -one. Like I could stop at any point and say, could you explain this more? I don't understand this part. Could you explain this more? So it feels like there is a lot of real-time interaction. So do you do you do you then create the audio video like within a few milliseconds? I'd love to understand the architecture behind it as well. But first I want to understand is that the am I getting it right that the AI keeps evolving or changing like every few milliseconds? Yeah, so the AI changes, uh, you know, it keeps evolving, right? Uh, it, it's sort of a 3D based infrastructure at the moment. Uh, it's not fully synthetic, which we started before, and we are going to come back to it in about six months. It's a latency issue. So at the moment, again, it's 3D. But in terms of some of the other questions that you just asked, uh, how does this work? So it's near real time, and it's going to be even faster in two months because now we are going to be using Grok chips, uh, Grok chips, sorry, because that's really going to change the game in terms of the latency part of things. And... Uh, you know, uh, it's stuck to our 7 billion parameter model, right? It's stuck to that, and that's essentially the language piece, and that keeps learning as every single user joins onto the system because it's essentially learning human behavior, right? That's the main stickiness part that we're looking at. But apart from that as well, when you are doing, let's say, a rack-based approach, you're giving it a PDF and it's teaching that, again, the latency improves because the answers it will give you from the questions is within that small domain, rather than the 7 billion domain. So these are uh, you know, some of the approaches that we use, and we want to be even more faster. At the moment, it's about, I think, the longest lag time is 1.8 seconds, where it's a complex answer, and it really has to get into the model and the document, etc. If it's an 18-page journal article, it's, you, know, you would feel like it's real time. So you talked about uh, building a language model even before OpenAI released it. Was it based on the transformer architecture, but you also mentioned rule-based, so I'm assuming there was something slightly different. Could you talk a little bit about how you ended up building your own language model at that time? It is a piece of iteration. So what we have is product version 2 now. We had MVB1, MVB2, product version 1, product version 2, so it obviously went on. But our MVB was literally... Uh, the easiest way of explaining it is we wanted to figure out what questions could people ask. I see. The materials can be done. 
and we ended up writing about 13,000 odd lines, going up to 16,000 lines of potential questions that could be ans- asked and potential answers that could be asked and we mapped that. That doesn't work. That's not a scalability piece. At that time, we were checking, could an AI teacher actually work and feel human-like? We got that. Then after that, we built some sort of uh, models, you know, even pre-transformer, etc. At the moment, ours is a transformer-based model. It's a fine-tuned model as well. So we use bits and pieces from open source models as well because no point teaching the model basic literacy or basic numeracy. So we use parts of Mistral maybe right now in our current model. It's a, it's a third generation. We use Orca, small alpaca, etc. And those things keep changing. They are very fluid. On top of that sits our proprietary data, which has come from 40,000 uh, learners learning with, with us for you know over the time that we have been on and that's the main value piece and that knowledge domain is more about the teaching aspects or is it more about specific topics because let's say if i want to use uh, the same ai for my corporate training all of my uh, data as well as content would be given using rag which i love to talk more about but the knowledge domain that you just talked about is that more about training? Is that more about how you deliver content? What is that knowledge domain about? Uh, I, I'll actually start with the problem. Right. Uh, I think that it'll make more sense. Nobody really trusts AI fully right now, period. We know it hallucinates, but people also don't, right? You also need this stamp. And if you look at the age-old industry as well, a university exists also partly to give that stamp or a stamp body exists to do that, right? Because you can trust them. There's this whole trust element. So what we say is, we are content agnostic. In the University of Bangor, we are teaching second-year psychology and statistics, right? In uh, some other institutions, we are teaching health sciences and medicine. We are trialing with Medtronic, one of the biggest companies in the world in medicine. Again, different domain. So what we're saying is, you've got your content, you give it to us, our AI teacher is going to teach it to all of your users. So in higher education students, employees for the... Uh, corporates, right? So that's your content, first of all. Second of all, to add to that, you know, this question of bias, is your AI getting biased, etc. Bias exists because of human beings, right? Every piece of content that's written has some form of bias and the AI can go wrong. So in this case, if the AI is saying something of bias, it's because of the choice of the document that you've given, right? Because if you're giving a biased document in a university as well, sometimes willingly, right? It's fine because it's coming from them. So it's it's not really something that we are uh, or our AI is pushing. Similarly, from the point of view of IP protection as well, especially for corporates, it's now your content being taught to only your users within a closed frame. So it's not really going out. And if you are a really big client and if you have that requirement, even that, you know, very IP-oriented data set and your user data set, that part of the bucket can be parked in your uh, server as well if you needed to. So these are the sort of problems that we were tackling rather than saying we're Gen, I- Gen AI first and let's create something cool because we are educationalists first. I've taught students of about 11 countries myself. My co-founder comes from higher education. She's a neuroscientist and psychologist. So all of these things play in. I see. So the problem statement, if I understood correctly, was that there's a lot of room for errors. There's a lot of room for hallucinations. So you try to approach the knowledge base from trying to plug that first and then be agnostic to the knowledge that you give on top of that. You, uh, If I understand correctly, it seems like you have a blended model starting with Mistral and maybe Llama or, or a few other open source ones. But you also mentioned fine-tuning, right? So fine-tuning, the way I understand it, is primarily to change the behavior versus giving it more knowledge. Is that correct in your scenario as well? At a very high level, uh, when we're using... So we used to use Lama and all before. Now it's Mistral or Kasma, Lalpak, etc. It's a combination. But at a very high level, that part of our piece is only 20%. It's purely to give it that breadth of tokens, the words it understands and can use. That's about it. On top of that, 80% is our proprietary data. And that's basically not only changing the behavior in our case, but it's also giving uh, the correct sort of choice of tokens and words, right? That behavior we're trying to shift. And a, a large part of this data 
is interactive data between a teacher and a student. That's the main part here because we are a teacher for hire, if you want to call it that. We are not content specific. So we have to be that best teacher, which is teaching students. So even if we think about this, you know, all of us have had this favorite teacher in our lives, right? And if we actually consciously think about it, it's not because they were an expert in the field. Maybe they were as well, but it's not because of that. It's because how they, you know, conveyed the knowledge to us, how they motivated us, how they encouraged us, you know, how they were asking us questions and answers, etc. That's the piece actually of focus for us. And that's the behavior change we do with our data. I understand correctly, obviously, you're not retraining or creating a brand new model. You take some existing models and fine-tune it. Uh, but from a tech perspective, the model tuning piece is basically a set of uh, queries and responses, right? Which is what the LLMs understand as, okay, this is my behavior, and then adapts to it. Is that is that how what you call as fine tuning, or is there something else you do on top of the open source models? That's part of it, but we also use reinforcement mechanisms as well because there are behavior patterns. Because that's very important. Otherwise, it's just going to be a. If I don't do that right, then you could again take my data set and put it on top of GPT for use a GPT builder and build that. There is a lot of reinforcement. That yeah, you understood. So RLHF for reinforcement learning with human feedback, and. Given that the models are changing quite a bit, how do you adapt to that? Like, how do you take that same fine tuning and the same RLHF and keep applying to the newer and the better models that keep coming out in the open source world? It's a continuous piece. Like, again, we're moving to Grok, right? It's just not about the models, it's about hardware, et cetera, as well. So, at any point in time, we we're working on a minimum of two other models. So, it's just a rinse and repeat sort of mechanism. And whenever, and we always have these internal tests and matrices that we follow. And you know, when we hit a target benchmark, or when we actually see some an anomaly which we didn't expect, then we. How big is your team that uh, keeps working on these model and the and the of course the fine tuning piece as well as the knowledge? We're a small team. Uh, we're twenty people. Fourteen are in tech. Part of the rest is also in research. Like my co-founder, she's in the pedagogy research the neuropsychology aspect of learning as well. So, yeah, we're a very small team. We are still at the stage of 70, 80 hour work weeks, but we love what we do. Yes, I'm very familiar with that work. So, Dev, the one thing I'd love to understand is obviously the underlying architecture, whatever you can share. So, if I understand correctly, the basis of after you've created the model when you work with a customer, it's based on retrieval augmented generation, right? So you take the content that your customer has or they have the content. And uh, I'm assuming a lot of these is unstructured. It could be PDF. But is that sometimes also structured? And do you vectorize everything? Or how do you how do you go about taking that content, putting it into a special container for that customer, and also, how do you do evaluations and making sure that what AI is delivering is actually accurate and there's explainability of that? Some parts, I'm sorry, I may not be able to sure. firmly touch. You obviously understand why. But I'll just say that, for instance, uh, you can upload direct text, right? You can upload PDFs uh, into the system. How we do that, because, you know, the age-old bane of readability of PDFs is a problem. We've got a crack there. We've got about 85, 86% uh, sort of readability in the amount of materials we're getting right now. Can't touch too much on that, but that's one of the things we do. But I think the most interesting part here, uh, you know, about the sort of efficacy of what's coming out, right? I think that's, again, interesting. What we have is a human in the loop. So instead of going completely with AI, we have a human in the loop. So if you were the lecturer, if you were the HR lead, if you were the team lead who is putting the content up, you have access to a dashboard, right? So within three minutes, we can do up to 340 pages of input and you're going to be just click buttons essentially, but you're giving prompts. So the output is going to come with a lesson of this size, question of this style, MCQ, whatever, whatever, right? That's already going to come out. When it comes out, you can see it already and you have real-time editing. Now, luckily, because it's you know heavily rag based, etc., there's a not not a lot of uh, editing left. Our output is so far you know extremely satisfiable to the clients, if I have to say that. But there's another reason for that. So let's say you put a research paper, and it 
took out what it was supposed to, but you want to change an example. You want to take a local example, right? Or you want to uh, put in a more topical example, or you want to do a little bit of a merge with something else. You have real-time capability of doing that. So that's one from the content part. From the question-answer part as well, apart from actually teaching students, it also gives you visibility, which you know uh, you will get because of the dashboard. So if you have 500 employees now, uh, the best you could uh, in the current state of the art, the best you would know if they've done their training is if they've completed the training, if they've watched their video, if they've downloaded their certificate. If you could get some qualitative data from a team lead or whatever, have they done it, right? In this case, you can see every single question they have asked the AI. Every single question the AI has asked them, if they got it right the first time, the second time, 60%, right, whatever. So at a very personal level, now you know which employee can be supported. You can support through the AI itself or otherwise. Also at a cohort level, 70% people are asking this question. Is that a foundational gap? Do I need to tweak that? So you have all of that visibility. And that comes hand in hand with also when you have the real-time question and answer with the AI, the human in the leap has uh, loop has full visibility. So it's, you know, in a technical sense, it's absolute reinforcement learning only because it's being reinforced by the actual customer. Um, and we are always talking to them. Infrastructure and the tech stack side, you have chosen with the large language models or not extremely large, but at least the open source 7 billion version. What's your general take on that? Like you mentioned that the readability is 83%. That's actually a little bit of surprise to me because I thought the libraries have gotten really good to even scan through the tables in PDFs and such using things like Llama Index. But what's your learning about the large language models in general and open source in general? Do you feel there's uh, like companies like your, they should go with open source or do you think the commercial ones like the Coheres and Anthropics as open AIs of the world, is there a huge quality difference between those models? So firstly about that 83% that I was uh, talking to you about, right? Maybe 85 now, whatever. Uh, part of that problem also happens because of the human user on the other side, because it's a non-technical staff. Sometimes they don't know difference between PDFs. They might just put a scanned picture in, etc. So that's why that anomaly happens. Uh, and again, the human in the loop is able to correct that. We have mechanisms in place to correct that. Anyway. But uh, I think, see, we believe in the importance of a specialized model. If you are building that absolute specialist doctor, AI doctor, you'll have a specialized model. It cannot run fully on a generalized model. So we are building that specialized teacher. I think when you're doing that, the general models are very good to prototype, right? Use that to prototype, prove your market, prove your at least solution market fit. But then you need to move into your own sort of specialized model. The open source has a very good advantage there because you can really layer it as you want, take bits and pieces as you want and do it and you have more control. Our own future of this is um, we will stay in this model for a long time because people like web only and app only, right? They like it. But uh, in about July this year, we are launching alpha versions of our products as Edge AI. Now that's going to be a very narrowed down version of language models that we are working on right now, taking from these existing stacks. So that's going to be about 99% our stuff. And it's it's going to be running on people's devices, this edge thing. And it's going to help in latency, right? It's going to help with uh, people's uh, privacy. Your data stays in your device. And even as a business, it actually helps a lot because I am hopefully uh, going to see a very sort of positive difference in our costs because a lot of that cloud costs now rests in your device. So that's how we are seeing it. And I think my only sort of sort of complain with the uh, bigger closed source models is, and it's not their fault because they're also updating and churning every day, right? There is a lot of inherent risk as and when they change their policies that can, you know, literally change entire dynamics. And if your whole product, if they are the electricity of your product, that creates a lot of issues. So you need to have that sort of control. And if you want to get into edge, edge versions, etc. as well, you need to have that sort of control. Yeah, it looks like you're really at the cutting edge then to reduce the latency of the overall AI model interaction with the end user. So I absolutely love that you're also using Grok now as well to reduce the latency between the query and the LLM. 
But what about the rag piece itself? If I switch gears a little bit, what are some of the lessons learned from it, both in terms of, you know, the architecture of whether you have a vector-only database or a database that does hybrid searches, storage, latency, all of that? What are some of the learnings that you have which other developers could definitely learn from when you think about the rag-based architecture? I'm going to start start slightly philosophically. Right? It's going to be about the problem that you are trying to solve, and you are going to create the solution for that problem. So RAG alone doesn't solve our problem, right? Even in the readability part, etc., a normal vector-based uh, you know system can work for us. But the readability part, the extraction part, we have overlay systems and we have sort of other systems that's not sometimes even AI uh, that we utilize, and then all of them work together to coordinate and give you the right output. Uh, you're not going to find uh, a single type of solution. Uh, it just doesn't exist. You just have to find the best way of doing it. And it's also going to change, not only because AI is changing very fast, but because your affordability and ability to use something for a solution when you're in early stage versus when you're in late stage, that's also going to change. So know where you want to go. Uh, try and do a patchwork in the beginning and get that. And it's always going to be a patchwork unless you are trying to create fundamental tech of the data moving around, do you think of it from the perspective of how much data is moving and can I reduce that uh, through consolidating your data stores or like what are what are some of the thinkings behind what should be the main thought when you're thinking about data? See, from a language point of view, language model point of view, right, in, uh, A, trying to make it smaller. I think that's the way the world should go. A lot of people are trying to, a lot of organizations are trying to show their heavy weight by creating larger models. And there is obviously a, a reason for that. And if you're going towards AGI, et cetera, you're researching in that way, you can. But in terms of consumer level AI, I think the logical step is to go smaller and more efficient because it helps you become more competitive. It helps your margins, et cetera. It helps your users by reducing latency, etc. That's one. The second point is, even when you have a relative sized model, which you can't really shrink further without uh, you know, affecting your output, it's also about how you can sort of align and predict which data is needed in which questions. That's a prediction uh, system that comes. You don't want it to you know, swipe through 7 billion parameters to give an answer. You want to be able to do that. That also... That sort of understanding is also very important for your edge AI versions because it's still a big model, right? Uh, even in your edge, you might have a little bit of a cloud uh, right. inference where you're switching parts of the models, right? So again, that understanding is very important. And then you can use non-AI-based techniques as well to remember things that people ask more like, you know, caching and things. So you mentioned about edge AI, data privacy, where your data stay, uh, stays at the on the device. And let's say if the large language model, or in this case, a tiny model is now sitting also on the device. How do you do RAG then? Because your your data, your custom data is still somewhere in the cloud. So is that what you mean that some of those trips still have to be made when it go, comes to RAG? Or are there other things that you're thinking about putting everything on the device itself see in the short run uh, the alpha versions that will come out in june we, al uh, we already have visibility of it right but when it comes out for the public uh, we are seeing a 40 percent reduction in cloud usage and then it's all about optimization etc it's it's not going to jump in directly to a 90 percent reduction but moving from that 40 percent to a 90 percent could be six months away could be nine months away i don't see it as a two-year problem world going since you've been deep into this in terms of uh, data platform and databases, do you feel uh, is there enough choices in the world today for people to pick one data store that does everything or you know, a combination of data sources? And do you also see the miniaturization of databases that it can run inside right next to your large language model on a device? I'll start with the second question. Uh, I think, yes, that's where the world is headed. Uh, you're going to have smaller, more efficient, but still called large language models, which can sit on your devices. It's not only about the uh, efficiency gains in the model. It's also about your hardware, right? Uh, Apple with its own silicon-based hardware. You can have more hardware coming in from other competitors. The hardware is going to go up uh, as normally they do with mobile, etc. So there are quite a couple of, you know, quite a few things that's going to 
you know the recent one that came out from NVIDIA as well, right? It's 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 a language model that's sitting yeah. on a computer. I think they've just triggered that new wave that's going to happen because I would rather have my Siri, my modern Siri, which is running completely in my phone. I don't want it to go up and down, and it's logical for it to happen. In terms of choices, etc., databases. I think we are in the beginning of mobile. You know, when or in the beginning of cloud, when cloud came out, you had this whole cloud infrastructure companies, cloud management companies, API companies, etc., coming up, all solving problems that exist. Uh, I just heard of one of these Y Combinator companies, which I'm going to try. They create API layer protection for language model integrations because that's become a big problem as well. People are hitting that. That's slightly different. So a lot of things going to come out. It's uh, I personally take out at least religiously 90 minutes a day on self-learning every day. It's incre- it's incredibly exciting, but it's incredibly fast. Yeah, I mean the overall data platform and its evolution. You mentioned about uh, you know miniaturization and being on the edge itself. What do you think about the large language model context sizes, right? So obviously, you know, the commercial ones, they have now some insane amount of context, like like Gemini Ultra has 1.5 million context tokens. Is that something you think uh, the open source models would also benefit from? And do you think the data management piece might go towards large language model itself? Or do you think it will always be disaggregated from the large language model, especially for RAG, and sit right next to the LLMs? At the moment, I think it's going to be still sitting next to it. Right? I, I, I'm not seeing that sort of uh, synergy uh, there yet. And it's got its advantages and disadvantages for doing that. But in, in terms of, again... You know, the general use case of large language models as well, right, to where they're going to go apart from the general side of it. I think they're going to head more towards uh, sovereign AI, uh, you know, that sort of space where you're getting these sort of national models, etc. versus consumer. Consumer always has to think because end of the day, any consumer business is about margins, right? You have to think about small. You have to think about control. Otherwise, you're going to get into problem. And I'll just give another example here as well, apart from the margins and the size, the small, that one uh, thing I talked to you about, those updates as well from open AIs, et cetera, which can affect people, right? And that's why you need the controls and that's where open source comes in. Um, the best way to explain this is if it, Meta changes their algorithms today, you as a marketer are screwed, you need to relearn. Same thing with Amazon, same thing with Inst- Instagram, et cetera. This almost becomes that. So if you are thinking of being a vertically integrated consumer company, as we are, we work from the model, we have our avatars, and we have our business logic in the middle. Having that control, trying to go as small as possible, as competitive as possible, is very, very important. And I also believe in uh, you know the six Ds as well, uh, you know, from the book Bold, uh, et cetera. It's eventually it has to go into that demonetized, democratized space. It cannot go there unless it's near free. And a large language model inherently cannot be that. It has to be smaller and it has to be more mobile and more uh, sort of uh, you know versatile if it needs to do that. But having said that, I think the last very interesting piece, I'm just qu- quoting ARK Invest here, but I found it really interesting is year on year at the moment, the cost of compute of large language models is falling by 60%. That's probably faster than, you know, Mozilla, et cetera. And uh, that, that's going to be exciting because what costs $4 million today will cost you a couple of hundred grand. just in a- So because of that, do you think a lot more companies would end up building blended models or creating their own models? It's hard to say, right? Because by that time, you might have a more stable policy of somebody like an open AI or an Anthropic, right? Uh, you might have better costings from them. You might have Grop spinning out something etc. So we don't know because even the closed source models are absolutely evolving because I thought one one very good move from a democratic standpoint was the creation of GPT builders uh, by OpenAI, right? Uh, it sounds all good, but it's not really ready there yet, but it could be very good in two years time as well when it actually becomes like a GPT app store, which they wanted it to be. Uh, some of, because we also do our MVP pilot, not MVP, but even POC pilots sometimes with these closed source models it's too early to say, like you can't even integrate it properly with the third-party UI at the moment, properly. So we don't know, to be honest. But there could be, there could absolutely be an appetite to do that by a lot of other people. 
And I don't think that's going to be the competitive edge. Again, it's going to be, you know, for people who've started this early, it will become a competitive edge, not because they understand the technology, which the other people can then as well. But it's because we are moving as our own model from now and from earlier on. So we are picking up a lot more proprietary data and a lot more learning. So we are ahead in the game. And those people have to catch up in the game, which can happen in tech very easily. But it's going to be more of a catch up rather than the tech being your mode. That's not what's so going mode. Going back to what you just touched upon, which is custom GPTs and maybe even assistant, I, I think that is a very a similar pattern to what you're doing, which is access to a large language model, access to certain tools that is custom to you, and access to the knowledge base, which is differentiated. Do you think uh, software engineering in general moving towards that direction of a much more agent oriented, or do you think it's just uh, you know it's just another way of doing things within AI these days? See, I think prompt engineering is a very big field. Uh, we do a lot of internships as well. We're actually training people in prompt engineering, and all of our hires uh, we never advertise. So our hires we first train people and then we hire. That's how we work. So prompt engineering is going to be a very big thing. So you can be a prompt engineer with minimal uh, understanding, a little bit of Python that can scrape a bit, sort out your data, you're fine. So I think that's going to be big. Secondly, for all of my engineers, I'm trying to now integrate co-pilots for everybody. It's not just because I think it's going to be good. I think that's the new way of working. They need to do that. And until 2030, even that whole teacher piece, right, we don't replace teachers. It's an out-of-classroom teacher in your pocket, right? And again, for coders as well, nobody's going to get replaced. Till 2030, you're going to have trillions of dollars spent on AI software to improve your productivity. You improve your productivity as a coder, as a teacher, etc. Post-2030, that's a different game. It's too early to say, but at that time, you're going to see indirect effects definitely because at least the hiring will slow down significantly because the productivity has gone up. And maybe direct, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, same thing about, uh, I feel the same thing about videos too, for example like Sora, which uh, OpenAI has been talking about, it's phenomenal. But at the end of the day, you would mm -hmm. still have human pieces to it. Like somebody still needs to come up with the storyboard, the music, and the story to bring it all together. So I do feel like maybe people will use it to enhance their skill. What takes them five minutes gets automated, but what takes them three hours will now take 30 minutes, but it's still humans be highly involved with that but let's let's go back so just touching on that as well that's why we have the human in the loop you will have the human mm -hmm. in the loop in that argument which is end of the day somebody has to think about the story because ai is an execution machine it is not a creative machine i get that right but uh my way of dealing with ai is uh, you know i would love to be and i hope i am in the race for agi we do you know we think about st stuff like that but my way of dealing with ai is is narrow intelligence Break a problem down into as many narrow points as possible. Storyboard, storyboard color, as micro as possible. If you can break that down together, you can teach each agent and each model to do that phenomenally well. And then it's just an integration game. It will do better than a human being in, you know, as a full director of a movie also. If you know, if you, from the business logic standpoint, understand what does a director do? It is possible theoretically. I don't think people go deep enough to understand what a teacher does or what a doctor is, just not your surgeon, right? How they are thinking, what is their mechanism? If you can break that down, you can easily make, like probably there are 46, I'm just saying, 46 things that a doctor does, right? If you have 46 agents working together, each one knowing yeah. that, that's a different game. I think agents are coming. I 100% agree with that. And that's why I'm a big fan of like uh, things like Autogen, from Microsoft, which is the agent mm -hmm. framework. The crew AI is the other one. But it's still not there. Like even if you get it to build out certain things with highly specialized agent, sometimes the collaboration goes in a loop. There are still certain things that's not there yet. But I 100% agree that's where the world is headed. Going back to, let's say, if I'm a brand new entrepreneur, AI developer, and I'm building something, what would you uh, what would you suggest? I, I totally get it. Depend on the problem that you're trying to solve, but what's the kind of uh, the emerging architecture? Like what what kind of database should you look at? Do you look at more at Python? Do you look at more in the front end React, or how do you think about the overall architecture? Or is it what technology that you're comfortable with? 
So I, I do understand uh, that a lot of technology people watch this show as well, and probably that's going to help them. And I'm actually going to give them a different answer here, as ever so slightly different answer to what you asked. If you're an emerging entrepreneur, right, an entrepreneur's job is to solve a problem and create value out of it by giving value to somebody else. Your value has to be higher, so you make a margin. So start with the problem. I know you told me not to repeat that, but I'll tell you from a technical standpoint what that means. What that simply means is today you have enough, enough tools to uh, create your POCs and MVPs. If it's a generative AI startup, use, absolutely, use a GPT builder, get a very small data set, make your stuff, use Flutter for all I care. No call, you put a front face to that and try and see if you've got a thousand customers. If you've got that, by the time you've done that six-week journey, right, already what you would have used or thought of building has already had some form of evolution already. So when you're fully ready, then you go into the next step of what do I need to do? Because at that time also, you'll get that clarity. Why are people using this bot version? And that will help you choose the technology. Otherwise, you're still going to play a guessing game in a fast So you mentioned Flutter. Uh, do, do you still feel a lot of the consumption, and I get it in education as well, is on the mobile devices or is it on desktop? Because I saw during COVID, a lot of that traffic shifted to desktop. But what do you see now, like based on your experience? I'll just tell you our data, still 50, you know, it's academic as well, right? But still 58% is mobile. And sometimes our learners could be learning in office, etc. So they are learning on the laptop, right? But still it's 58% mobile, so it's all right. Last few questions. First of all, thank you so much for doing this. Really appreciate it. But what are some of your AI favorite tools? Ah, <laughs> Grok, Grok, absolutely. Like Grok's blown my mind. We're, we're testing it. Let's see how good that is. I think AI, again, it's not only about the market, but AI as a, even as an educational sort of area, right? It's multidisciplinary. It's not tech. It's HCI, it's psychology, it's philosophy, it's maths, etc. Similarly, the industry itself, it's hardware, it's software, it's connections, you know, it's your APIs. You'll, you're probably going to have a Zapier in, uh, for AI, etc. as well. So it's a very massive one. From a foundation standpoint, I think Grok is incredibly good. From one that's helping me personally a lot, I think as an open source language model, uh, Mistral is very good. Um, we are also working on avatars at the moment. We don't really have those avatar things. We are ahead in the synthetic avatar space. And slightly eager to see what Synthesia does because I think over the last one year, they have really slowed down because they should have been in the game already. And we would have maybe plugged them in for six months until we built our own. When you say Grok, you mean G-R-O-Q, not G-R-O-K from Elon Musk, right? Speaking of, have you tried the open source version of Grok that uh, the 300 billion parameter that Elon Musk uh, released? It's on the list of my Sunday to do. I'm going to do it more for fun uh, because theoretically it doesn't work for us because it's just too big of a model and you know we're That's... heading to it small but i'm going to play with it what does a typical day look like for you when you think it's the most productive day like are you a night owl or you are early riser what does a productive day look like for you i've made myself an early uh, riser uh, i'm usually at my desk by 6 6 30 one of the reasons is because we have some team members in Asia as well, and I'm the product owner, et cetera, right? So I like to have my morning meetings and have that done by 10, 10 30. So that's why I've become a morning person. Uh, I've added ice baths. Uh, I think that was cool. Uh, they closed our local spa down, so I had to buy one of these plasticky ones, but that works. And I usually work till about 8 p.m., sometimes 10, but I've cut that out because I had, uh, I think, two burnouts last year. Uh, so again, learned it the hard way. So till about eight and then I clock off. I, I like to cook dinner every day. That's my meeting. And you've already given some great uh, pointers and advice to developers starting off in the AI space. But let's go even further back. If it was a student and they're trying to get into AI and technology, and I know there's this very famous video going around of Jensen on talking about people not having to learn code what, what's your advice for the new generation that's coming into this brand new world that nobody has ever seen? Again, see, try it. Uh, you have to find $20 from somewhere to get a GPT builder, right? You need to do that. You can use Webflow to create the front face, not even Flutter. First, try the problem. The tech is there. There's more than enough tech to solve your problems today. That's number one. 
a little bit of a sneak peek on myself as well. I've worked in research with Alan Turing Institute, Berlin University, London, etc. But I got into AI as a, you know, it was a self-styled learning. My academic background is law. So it can absolutely be done. It's not no code, low code. I don't agree with Jensen Huang fully on what he says. But you don't really have to slog in Python, etc. as well, because you might, you suddenly might have a language that's more fitting for generative AI that's come up. And then Python's gone, right? Understand the fundamentals. And coding, I think the most important part of it, which I've learned, self-style, right? More than actual coding is it's a way of thinking. It's a logical way of thinking that is very, very important if you want to be in the tech business. Very well said. Paul, thank you so much, Dev. I really appreciate you being part of this show. And I wish you all the best for whatever you're doing in the teaching community. Thank you.